If you're seeing this, it's because I'm now a dad of two, and that means that I'm already sleep deprived to the point that you would not want to see me right now. So we're taking some old blogs from back at the very beginning of Checkpoint before these nerdy sermons ever existed. We're remastering them, making them for you to enjoy probably for the first time, because these blogs were read like four times the first time. All this is to say, if these feel different than normal, it's because they are, but I'm very excited to offer them to you. Anyway, today's is from Star Wars, which surprisingly, given that we're a church for nerds, geeks, and gamers, we really don't talk about enough on this channel. Specifically, we're talking about the very first Star Wars movie. You know, not that one, like the, like the real first one, like the first one that anyone ever got to experience. The original Star Wars movie may not have been given the title of A New Hope until sometime after its release, but make no mistake, the title is very appropriate and extremely to the point of the hope that we find in the Bible. Let's talk about it. Folks, welcome to Checkpoint Church, where nerds, geeks, and gamers come together to talk about faith games and scruffy nerf herders. I am your nerd pastor, Nate, and if you like these weekly deep dives, be sure to sub, hit that bell, and find out when the next one drops. Folks, as always, we're going to be starting with our scripture for this one. Our scripture from today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. I'm going to be reading from the NRSV. That's my preferred translation. It's what's going to be on the screen. If you have a translation that you prefer, feel free to use that as well. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents, to another, two, to another, one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed it over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yikes, right? Believe me, I get it. This passage is troublesome for so many reasons. It's a hard one to read from the outset. By the end, it leaves me wanting a kind of like charming resolution, but it doesn't give that to me at all. I want the Marvel movie predictable ending. I want everybody to come out on top, but they just don't. And it really hurts. Let's start with the obvious, shall we? The language is hard for many of us to read. I admit, I was tempted to cut and snip this parable to exclude all of the times the word slave is used. I thought about finding a different translation altogether. Confession, I even considered just control plus F and then replacing all of them with a word of my own choosing. Please, don't harass me, biblical scholars. I resisted the temptation this time. In the end, I decided to put the full text with the original New Revised Standard Version language. Why? Well, because it's important to look this one in the face. It's important to hear what exactly Jesus is offering up in this story. It's important to know why? Let's be real here. There's a bigger problem with this text. Beyond the master-slave complex that plagues human history, this story feels downright harsh. The master in the story, which can safely be assumed to be fulfilling the role of our God trope, throws the third slave into our biblical understanding of the pit. Not just any old pit, but the one that often gets confused with the idea of hell. Ugh, I hate that word. I hate the idea of it. I hate how it gets used to harm people, but here we are. So we need to talk about it. To recap, we have three slaves, one master. The big dude is about to go on a trip somewhere. He has to entrust the property to these three amigos. For some reason, 
The master divides up his talents, the largest weight of currency in the Bible. We can try to pin a number to it if we want. I've heard it made equivalent to about 16 years of labor. A Google search will equate it to a modern $1.4 million. Regardless, it was a hefty chunk of coins. The master commander gives one slave five talents, another two talents, and the third a single talent. And then there's this fun bit of language here. The master does this according to their ability. More on that in a moment. The first two slaves invest their talents by trade and double them. The final slave buries the talent in the ground, preserving the original amount for the master upon his return. Some time passes and the master returns, deciding to settle up. Like clockwork, the first two present their earnings. The master gives them a joyful pat on the back and all's well in the world. And then the third slave meekly steps up to the plate and offers the single talent back to the master. Here's where things go to the pit. The third slave, eh, he doesn't really start off very well. He explains that he did not invest the talents because the master is a harsh man who takes money that he does not deserve or earn by his own hands. Great start. The slave was afraid did not produce this mafia-like result and thus didn't do anything. Obviously, this sets the head honcho off. He rips the one measly million dollars from the third slave and gives it to the dude with 10 talents, making him even richer. And then kicking the third slave while he's down, the master orders him to H-E double hockey sticks. Again, yikes. What was Jesus doing with this message? Why even tell this story? The rich get richer? We should be trading stocks, NFTs, Wall Street would be proud? Where does this align with everything else that we understand? Using our three rule structure from Checkpoint, how does this have anything to do with doing good, doing no harm, or striving to grow? Okay, you know what? I got an idea. How about we take a breather, tell another story. There's this kid. He's a scruffy young blonde that works for his dad's half-brother on a farm. It blows. The kid really wants to make something of himself, but thinks that farming is no way of living. He wants to be a soldier and save lives. Turns out, there's a retired vet living not too far from him. Even better, he's willing to teach him how to use a weapon. After training for a while, he gets caught up in this big plot and learns a ton about himself. Get this, the kid is actually the child of a famous high-ranking soldier and a politician. Not only that, he has a twin sister who was adopted by literal royalty. It's a rough realization. He'd been scrounging around on a moisture farm all of his life on Tatooine while his twin had been living up the good life on Alderaan. By now, I'm sure that you figured out to whom I'm referring, especially given that you are here at Checkpoint Church. In the epic space opera Star Wars from 1977, we witness the story of Luke Skywalker and his journey of family, sacrifice, and purpose. As the film gathered traction and spawned sequels, comic books, novels, video games, Lego figurines, conventions, so much more, the original hit film was given an alternate title, Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. How about that? Finally, we get that good word out there. Hope. Why? Why was Star Wars changed to that title? This has been a point of some debate for a while in the nerd community. Is Luke the New Hope? Or is it a New Hope for Obi-Wan or the Jedi Order or the Rebellion? Who is or are the Hope? And who or whom is the Hope for in the long run? And most importantly, is it really a New Hope? Hope is an incredibly important word for us during the season of Advent, which is whenever these blogs were originally written. Wherever you may be with God, that season represents a time of waiting. The words that we attribute, normally represented by colored candles, are symbols of our human response to that period of waiting. As Christians, we're anticipating the second coming of Jesus Christ. As people, though, we're anticipating something else. We're anticipating change. We're anticipating something amazing. We're anticipating that new job, new city, new relationship. We're anticipating the evolution of that thing in our lives. We're anticipating a return to a warm memory of our childhood. We're anticipating a chance for that cherished, unconditional love. What are you anticipating right now? Is it just in Christ alone, or is it something more that Christ brings? The first word presented during the time of Advent is the word hope. We're called to be a hopeful people. We're called to approach times of uncertainty with hope. We're called to enter into hurt, pain, confusion with absolute hope for the resulting circumstance. Would you define yourself as a hopeful person? I find myself far from hope too often. This is one of the reasons that I cherish that season of Advent every single year. I get to sit and contemplate where my hope lies. I get to find the spots of my life that I don't have so much hope. Whenever this blog was first written, my daughter was having trouble with walking and had to be admitted into physical therapy. Well, she got admitted to physical therapy while I was admitted into stress, anxiety, and if we're being honest, hopelessness. There were days where I was certain something was wrong and that this would never end. I had a voice in my head telling me that she would never walk and that this was going to be all my fault. That's hopelessness. That's the pit. God had given me a talent in the shape of a sassy, beautiful baby girl. The darkness in my brain wanted to bury that talent and think that God is just a cruel God who would give my daughter the burden of immobility because God is just a harsh master, right? That's the temptation. When times get tough, my hopelessness comes out 
in droves. It convinces me of the worst case scenario. Worse yet, it pushes my own feelings onto the supposed actions of God. I blame, I chastise, I pray. Why have you forsaken me, God? But in the end, I somehow persevered. With the help of a loving family and a ridiculously strong wife, we sent our baby girl to months of physical therapy. And now we can't keep her from running to our master bedroom to pretend the plunger is a lightsaber. God's good, right? Of course God is good. It's tempting to just let this be a cute anecdote, to brush this off as a miracle and declare God as the powerful creator that God is. But let's not take away the power of the Holy Spirit and the hope that was provided here. Let's not miss the forest for the trees. Let's not bury our talent away. Let's not set the future up as an act of everything happens for a reason apologetics and rob ourselves of the hope in this scenario. God is good, yes, but so was the perseverance of my wife and I. Because of us, we've been rewarded with the toilet Jedi running around like a coked up jackrabbit. I'm not talking about some prosperity gospel here. We didn't just pray the pain away. We cried. We bore the burden. We kept moving forward. We put our full hope into God, and we also put our full hope into the physical therapist, the pediatrician, our family, our daughter, and each other. Now, the source of hope is God, but the conduit of that hope, it has to be you. Don't be overwhelmed or get a big head over this. This is a huge responsibility. We've each been given the role of being hope for someone or someones. Sometimes we have to be the hope each and every day. Sometimes we might only have to be that hope once in a blue moon. Whenever you start to get cocky, remember that God is the source. But whenever you start to get overwhelmed, remember this. God gives to each according to our ability. Now, I promise that we'd come back to this earlier. I find it so interesting that Jesus includes this tidbit in this parable. Some slaves could handle five, others two, and some only one. But according to the great narrator, all three had it within them to handle what they were given. After some time with the story, I've only found one thing that really hurts the message, the first two slaves story. I wish we could get a deeper look into what kind of trades they each made. Were they easy trades? Do you think they happened quickly? Were they dangerous? How did their families handle it? Did they have good support? The only difference that we get between these two that we get from the parable is that the third slave was scared. Was that really the only difference? Is it possible that the first slave might have had to keep going to physical therapy week after week to drop off his daughter, only be told that we'd have to extend it for another month? Is it possible that the first slave might have held his wife and cried, thinking about whether or not the trade would actually go through as anticipated? Jesus tells us that each of the slaves had the ability, but ability does not connote ease. I so badly wish that Jesus might have said, the first slave took the five talents and worked himself to the bone. For years, the slave lost three talents, then worked like a dog to make them back. He didn't sleep some nights. His back would ache all the time. He never had any time to play video games, and sometimes that really bummed him out. He had some bad days. Wouldn't that be nice? Instead, we only get to hear that it's within their ability to do it. Where might those realistic stories come from instead? Where can we hear of the successful stories of hardship from the faithful slaves? If this pastor had to argue it, then he might say that we get these stories from one another. Storytellers will always offer up the best stories, fact or fiction. For example, what if we consider the fictional story of a scruffy nerf herder, one who loses his hand after learning that his father is actually an evil space tyrant who's murdered untold amounts of people, one who loses friends and family, one who trains under the guidance of a loopy green alien. Yes, a Jedi's strength flows from the Force. One who watches his father figure, old Ben Juan Kenobi, get ended right before his eyes. The story of Luke Skywalker is certainly one of the talents spent wisely. What if Luke just hadn't? What if Tatooine moisture farming was just enough for him? Or what if upon learning the true identity of Darth Vader, Luke just called it quits, let go, and fell out into the cold abyss of space? These are all options, but Luke chose hope again and again and again. Luke chooses hope. Perhaps that's the truth behind the title, A New Hope. It's not just Luke or Obi-Wan. Each and every time there's a choice between hope and despair, these are all talents. These are all chances for us to say yes to a newly offered hope, a new hope for right now. So let's go back once more before we close. Let us set aside the problematic language. Let us set aside the casting into the pit. Let us set our sights on the third slave. Faced with the decision, does he put that talent to work or risk the presumed rage of the master? Does he bury the talent and at least end up without losing anything in the end? Does he choose fear or boldness? Does he choose despair or hope? The slave chooses fear. The slave chooses despair. The slave chooses himself. This line of decision-making leads to a life in the metaphorical pit, the place where there is gnashing of teeth and weeping, the place where the parents feel hopelessly inadequate. 
and the child remains immobile under the crippling weight of a guilt-ridden life. The place where an inexperienced Jedi mopes for the loss of those he loves under the thumb of a revenge-filled patriarch. You see, the pit is the antithesis of hope. The master has no choice but to cast the slave there because in all reality, it's the path that was chosen when hope was abandoned. Where are you right now? Are you in the pit? Are you right at the start of a hard time? Are you standing in front of the tough decision between hope and despair? Hear the good news. You've not been given more than within your ability. No sugarcoating. It may be tough. It may feel impossible. It may be impossible on your own. But look to the light of the hopeful. Look to the examples of those who kept on moving. God doesn't need you at your best. Checkpoint Church doesn't need you to have it all figured out. I don't expect you to be all smiles and give me some vague truisms about how God's got you. I know that God's got you. I want to know that you've got you. And if you don't, then I want to stand there and bear your tears. I want you to try to drag me down with you so that I can hold you up. And anyone else who's hearing this, I want you to do that for others too. I want you to be the hope that you were called to be. I don't want you to freeze up, panic, and bury what God has placed before you. I want you to be the hope that moves. So whether you're comfy on Alderaan or working the fields of Tatooine, know that you're always welcome here at Checkpoint Church. Folks, thank you so much for watching this video. I so appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for these weekly deep dives. We are usually streaming on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and we're usually on Discord 24-7, but given the paternity leave stuff, it might be kind of a weird time, so be patient with us. The best thing you can do is join Discord to find out when we're going to be live, what we're going to be doing, and how our schedule is going there. Hey, quick question for you. What is your favorite Star Wars movie, canon or non-canon? I'm really only asking this because I like to watch the world burn. Mine is probably The Empire Strikes Back. Please don't hate me. I just, I love that Leo Yoda jumping around. With that, we're going to end this video as we always do with our three things that we believe to true about every single one of you out there watching, regardless of whether or not you may believe in God, not believe in God, go to church, not go to church, like Star Wars or like Star Trek. None of those things change these three things that we believe to be true about every single person watching this video at any given time. Number one, we believe that God loves you, like really, really loves you. Number two, we love you. We want community with you. That's what we're doing on Twitch and Discord and YouTube. And number three, we believe that you, yes, you matter. You are a person of sacred worth. The world is a better place. Why? Because you are in it. Folks, with that, and until the next time that I see you, I hope that you're well. And until then, bye bye Well, how you being such a baby? Come on, baby. You're a real baby, baby. Dang it, baby. <laughs> Dang it, baby's pretty good. <laughs> Dang it, baby.